Hey everyone, this is David Brown with the migration update for March 2nd, 2023 from the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch. The second day of the count was another cold one. It was overcast the entire day and the winds were moderate, mostly from the west. And it wasn't as strong as they had forecast, thankfully. So actually it wasn't that bad of a day. A little bit chilly to be out, but um, not strong enough to really make it difficult to bird. The bay was about the same as yesterday, which is mostly open but frozen along the near shoreline and into the marina. And that ice is a perfect spot for gulls and swans to gather. And here in the middle, we have a lesser black backed gull. And you can see, compared to the herring gulls that are nearby, that it's a little bit smaller. It's kind of a skinnier gull. It's also very long, the wingtips stick out pretty long um, compared to great black backed gull, which would have an even darker back and be larger than the herring gulls. In this photo, we can also sort of make out the yellow legs that lesser black-backed gull has compared to pink legs for great black-backed gulls. There was a small group of Canada geese hanging out in the park when I got there, and overall there weren't a ton of Canada geese today, maybe a couple hundred total, a few migrating flocks, but uh, much fewer numbers than yesterday. I noticed both yesterday and today that these two mute swans are hanging out away from all the other swans on the ice in front of the hawk watch, and that's usually a spot where a pair of mute swans nests, so I'm wondering if this is that nesting pair kind of claiming their territory already. As I was scanning, I noticed a dark spot in the marsh, and it was actually a male northern harrier hunkered down. Here we have a flock of northern shovelers, and you can see that huge honking bill that they have. Here we have a bald eagle, but this is a really interesting bird. Normally when you see a bald eagle that has a dark head and a dark underside, that's a juvenile bird, meaning a first year. But this one actually isn't. This is, I believe, a third year bird. And the way I can tell that is, if you look at the wings, there's one feather in the middle of each wing that sticks out a little bit farther and is kind of a lighter brown color compared to the darker feathers that make up the rest of the wing. That's actually a retained juvenile feather. So that's a feather that the bird would have grown in the nest. And the way bald eagles replace their feathers after the first year, they replace some of the feathers in the wing. And then after another year, they've replaced almost all of them. And when they get to this age, like I said, they might only have one feather like this in each wing that has not been replaced yet. So um, that allows us to age the bird. But as far as the dark underside and the really dark head, I don't really have an explanation. Um, I talked about it with some other people, and we think it's just part of the natural variation. You know, some bald eagles of this age and similar ages are extremely white and others might be extremely dark like this. But it's really cool. I, I don't think I've ever seen a bald eagle quite like this. Here we have an adult red-tailed hawk. So we can see in the shoulder area, it has those dark patagial bars, and we also see the dark belly band across the underside. And we know it's an adult because it has a dark trailing edge to the wing, and the tail is red. And again, on red tails, it's the top of the tail that's more of a bold red from the underside. Um, it looks more pinkish usually, um, but juveniles would show more streaking on the underside of the tail also. Here we have an adult female northern harrier. And remember, with harriers, the adult males are distinctive. They're kind of this gray or silver color. We call them gray ghosts. Whereas the adult females and the juveniles of both sexes are more of this brown type, as we call them. But we can tell that this is an adult female because of all that streaking on the upper breast. There's also um, a little bit more heavily marked in the patagial areas. Again, that's that shoulder area. Uh, juvenile northern harriers, usually a bit more plain underneath. They don't have that streaking. They can be a bit orange underneath. And they're a little less heavily marked in the patagial area. So this is an adult female. Around noon, we started to get some pretty big migrating flocks of snow geese. And um, over maybe about a half hour or so, we had multiple flocks adding up to over 2,000 snow geese. And then throughout the afternoon, we had maybe another 500. So kind of interesting to see. Yesterday, we didn't have a ton of snow geese. I think only less than 100 for the day. But today, they seem to be on the move, even though the winds weren't really out of the south at all. Just kind of a westerly wind. But that's how it goes sometimes. 
Here we have a horned lark. And like I mentioned in yesterday's video, with horned larks, we just kind of get small groups or sometimes large groups, but mostly uh, individuals or small groups that are flying over. Here we have a great black-backed gull. And great black-backed gull is the largest gull in the world. So when it's next to herring gulls, which are the most numerous gull we have currently, um, the great black-backed gull is even bigger. And it has a darker back than the lesser black-backed gull we saw earlier. And in the winter, another way you can tell between the two black-backed galls is lesser black-backed usually has some streaking on the neck and head area, whereas great black-backed galls like this are very clean white throughout the whole neck and head area. Here we have a northern harrier perched up in one of the small trees out in the marsh. This is an immature herring gall, so just kind of a big bulky gall that's real dirty looking underneath. Here's a bird that was flying really high up. I never would have seen it if it wasn't a cloudy day. Um, I just happened to see it naked eye. And at first I wasn't even sure it was a bird. I had to put my binoculars on it to confirm that it was even a bird. And even doing that, I had time to pick up my camera and snap some shots as it went overhead. But this is actually a pretty good bird. This is a Lapland Longspur, which is something we get at the Hawk Watch most seasons. But sometimes they're difficult to get. Um, but they'll mix in in small numbers in flocks of horned larks. And um, it's a species a lot of times we associate with being found in the winter on uh, farm fields with horned larks and snow buntings. Um, but this is a species that's quite rare a lot of places, so it's always fun to get. Um, as a high flyover, I guess the main thing that stands out is it has kind of like a dark throat. Um, that's the main thing that caught my eye. It's kind of a distinctive facial pattern on the bird, too, if you get a view from the side. But from underneath, um, the, the main way we're identifying it is just that there's not really any other species that look similar to this with that dark throat. Here are some tundra swans taking off from the bay, probably going to continue their journey north. And a lot of the tundra swans go pretty far west, even like over to Alaska, so... Really cool to see the uh, migration path that some of these species take and to think that we're just one little stop on a journey that can be thousands of miles long. Here we have some more snow geese migrating by. And look at the shape of this flock. A lot of times when we think of Canada geese migrating, we think of them being in V formations. When snow geese migrate, sometimes they're in messier groups like this, where instead of a V, it's more of like a U. Um, so that's one thing that you can look for that stands out at a distance sometimes that maybe it's something you want to take a closer look at. And again, snow geese have black wingtips. So that's one thing you can look for to help distinguish them from tundra swans. But tundra swans would also have a much longer neck and usually wouldn't fly in a messy formation like this. Tundra swans also like to fly in Vs. Here we have a flock of ring-necked ducks. And from a distance, they can look similar to some other duck species, for example, greater and lesser scop. But scop show more white on the wings. Um, these ring neck ducks don't really show much white at all on the top side of the wing. Here we have another gall. And we see that this one is quite pale. It's kind of a lighter shade of gray than we see on the herring galls and ring-billed galls. But maybe the main thing that stands out is if we look at the wingtip, there's no black. So this is actually an Iceland gall. And the way a lot of times you pick them out is you're looking for the gall that does not have black wingtips. So that's how I spotted this one. It was actually when all the, the um, galls got flushed by a raptor. Um, you can also pick them out when they're standing on the ice when galls fold their wings. It's all the way at the back. On the herring galls and the ring-billed galls, you'll see that black. That's the wingtips that are folded closed. So if you find a gall that does not have that, it might be an Iceland gall. There's another species that can look very similar to this, which is Glaucus gall. And I'm pretty sure in my identification that this is an Iceland gall, just based on my sense of size in the field. Um, but plumage-wise, they can look very similar. So from a distance, it can be difficult when you have them flying around. When you have them on the ground with other galls, it can be pretty easy because Iceland gall is smaller than herring gall, whereas Glaucus gall is bigger than herring gall. So... Um, Iceland galls are kind of um, a smaller, more petite 
cute faced gall. Glaucus galls are just kind of big and mean looking. Here we have an adult female northern harrier hunting the marsh. And we get a nice look at that white rump patch, which is one of the key field marks. Here we have another red tailed hawk. And if we look at that shape, that is just classic red tail, classic beautio soaring shape. So if there's a shape that you want to learn for hawk watching, this is the shape to learn. When we talk about other species of hawks, we compare it to the red tail. When we talk about exhibitors having long tails, it's in comparison to the red tail. When we talk about falcons having pointed wings, it's in comparison to things like the red tail. We can tell this is a red tail. Even from this distance, we can see those dark patagial bars in the shoulder area. And we can see the red tail and the dark trailing edge to the wing to let us know that this is an adult. Um, in this photo, you can't really make out the belly band very well. Um, but red tails are the only beauty of that have those dark patagial bars. So when we get other species like red-shouldered hawks and broad-winged hawks, they don't have those bars. And rough-legged hawk is another beautio that we see. They don't really have dark bars. They have more dark squares in that area. And this was the bird of the day and really the bird of the season so far. And it's not a super rare bird to get at the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch, but it is a super rare bird to get on March 2nd in this area. So this is a cliff swallow. And from the photo, which is quite distant, we can make out that it's got kind of a light forehead, a dark face, um, an orange rump patch, just classic field marks for a cliff swallow. There's another species that's very similar that's even rarer in this area called cave swallow. Um, and I made sure to get photos to be able to distinguish between them. Cave swallows have more of a, an orangish face, so you would see contrast between the light cheek versus the dark cap. And they also don't have a white forehead. They have like a reddish forehead. Um, and we actually had a cave swallow a couple of years ago in early April from the East Spit, which is right nearby the Hawkwatch. So it's something that's definitely possible in the spring, although I think that is one of the few spring records for this area or maybe for all of New York State. Um, it's a species that shows up more in like November. Um, but anyway, this was um, something I wasn't expecting to see. I saw naked eye that it was a swallow flying and I was assuming, okay, maybe it's an early tree swallow, which I think even that would be quite rare right now. But um, of the swallows that show up, tree swallow is usually the first one. Um, but I was really surprised when I put up my binoculars and noticed uh, those field marks I talked about with the bright white forehead and the orange rump. So I immediately switched and tried to get photos. Unfortunately, right when I picked up my camera, he turned and was going away. So when it was closest to me, all of my shots are of it going away. And I just had to stay on it until it turned sideways again, finally. So when I got the better angle on the bird, it was more distant. So this is kind of the best I was able to come up with, which obviously isn't uh, real great, but I think it's enough to um, confirm it as cliff swallow and eliminate the even rarer cave swallow. And I looked to see where else cliff swallows have been reported this year, and there's no confirmed sightings on eBird anywhere for the eastern U.S. There's a few sightings in Texas, but that's the closest. So this is a pretty unusual sighting. I looked at my data from last year and I didn't have one until April 25th. So again, just an idea of how early this sighting is. Here's another bald eagle and we can see this one is almost an adult. Still got a little bit of immature markings. You can see it's got some white where it should be brown and some brown where it should be white. If we take a look at the eBird checklist from today, I had 49 species, which really good. Yesterday, 56 species. Today, 49. I mean, to be getting around 50 species this time of year without south winds is pretty good. So I think overall I've been pretty lucky this year with the, the number of birds that have been around and the variety and just getting those couple of rarities. And if I take a look at hawk count, today for migrant raptors we had two bald eagles and three red-tailed hawks for a total of five migrant raptors. And before we get into the forecast for the upcoming days, let's take a look at Derby Hill and Derby Hill are kind of our rivals. They're further east along the lake shore. And if we look at their results from today, 
they had two birds, one rough-legged hawk and one gerfalcon. So gerfalcon is very rare. Um, it's always something that's possible up on the lake shore, and it's something that hawk watchers hope for. Um, if you're not familiar with gerfalcon, it's more of a northern falcon species, even larger than a peregrine falcon. Um, just massive falcons that are usually associated with being farther north, but there's some that come down this far south some winters. So it's a really rare bird to see any time in the United States, but uh, to get one at a hawk watch is just um, sort of a grail bird for a lot of people. And the counter at Derby Hill this year is Brandon Brogel, who was also the counter last year. But last year we didn't know each other, but since last season we've met each other a couple times at different hawk watches. So we've been staying in touch this year, so that should be fun, just communicating back and forth between the two hawk watches. Taking a look at the weather forecast, for tomorrow we're looking at cloudy skies early, then a mixture of light rain and snow in the afternoon. Winds out of the east at 15 to 25 miles per hour. My one wind app is showing it more of a northeast wind, which is really our worst wind, and that's really strong. So um, not good conditions at all for migration. Um, might be some birding potential in the morning. Uh, you know, should be a lot of gulls and ducks around and stuff, but wouldn't really expect to see raptors. And then with that rain and snow moving in, it might end the count early. For Saturday, we're looking at 8 to 12 inches of snow overnight, Friday night into Saturday morning. And then the snow is kind of transitioning into snow showers for Saturday afternoon with north winds 15 to 25 miles per hour. So um, just with the amount of snow and those unfavorable winds and the time of the season, uh, it's very likely that the count won't be held on Saturday. Looking at Sunday, cloudy with a high in the upper 30s, winds west-northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. So kind of very similar to con conditions to today. So would expect similar things, probably some raptors, um, decent birding overall, right? It's, at least it's not raining or snowing. Um, but we're still early in the season, not a ton migrating yet when we don't have south winds. But everything will be coming. I've been looking at the other reports on Hawk Count. And um, if you go on to hawkcount.org and take a look at the past couple of days, you get these sites in like Panama and Costa Rica that are getting tens of thousands of turkey vultures, you know, 30,000 turkey vultures, 40,000. So a lot of long distance migrants on the way. And um, we're really only about four weeks out from the peak of the turkey vulture migration here. Well, I think the season has got off to a pretty good start for birding overall. Maybe not the raptor numbers we're hoping for yet, but they'll be coming in their time. A um, couple visitors out at the Hawkwatch today getting to meet some new people and some new BBRR volunteers, so that's good. And uh, I hope that all of you watching have a chance to come out at some point during the season, hopefully on a day with southwest winds that we see a lot of hawks. From Lyco Birds, this is David Brown. Thanks for watching.